Welcome back to Rusted Junk, the 80s movies podcast. Do you find yourself wanting to put on a corked hat, fight crocodiles in the outback and then move to New York? How about befriending a, an alien by dressing him up as a ghost on Halloween? If so, this is the podcast for you. If you remember searching for that perfect film from Blockbuster, and if you grew up in the UK, waiting for that one VHS copy to be turned to the newsagents, then welcome. We'll have fond memories waiting for you. I'm Charlie, and the rest of the Rusted Junk team are Amanda. Hello. Joe. No, do you are. And Dom. Hello. Hey, hey, just before we get cracking, um, there's quite a lot of swearing in this film and quite some quotable lines. I take it we're avoiding profanity. Is that, is that right? No, I don't think so. I click the explicit button on this one. It's fine. Okay. Well, you, you I mean, I won't. Button. I have a button, yeah. You've I've got, got a... to be. I've got a button when I load it. I've got to say oh, this. Sod this... it. You've got the fuck button. <laughs> Everyone's the, got the a fuck button, fuck Amanda. Button. Just, whether, just whether it can be found or not, that's the, that's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. It's going to be that type, of, that type of show. Right. And the film we're looking at this time is the 1987 uh, film With Nail and I, uh, starring uh, Richard E. Grant, Paul McGann, Richard Griffiths, Ralph Brown, and others, which we'll get to in Roll Call. But, Dom, this is your film. Uh, again, I don't want to make it sound like, why did you pick it? Why did you choose this film? Well, usually when I pick a film, I try and choose something which is going to kind of stimulate a bit of debate. There are you know, pros and cons. Maybe it's a flawed uh, choice, but in a, in a positive way. But but I, I changed tact a little bit here and went for something which is uh, a film that I love. And you know, spoiler um, alert, it's, it's one of my favourite films. Uh, I guess, how would I describe it? Probably a black comedy, um, a cult classic in the UK at least, but it's probably has transcended cult status, I think now it is probably a mainstream popular film, uh, as you say, released in 1987. But I remember in the 1990s, very distinctively, it became big, really off the back of probably lad culture around that sort of time. Um, obviously alcohol being a big theme in this film, but it's, um, yeah, I think uh, an example of excellent British filmmaking and Personally speaking, not at all nationalistically, but I don't think we do enough British films on this pod. So we've had a look at The Long Good Friday. We're updating that now to with Fish Called Wonder. I mean, how many do you want? Yeah, percentage-wise, though, pretty small, I think. And, and of course, my esteemed colleague, friend, depending on what he says about this film, acquaintance, Joe, I'm particularly fascinated to see whether or not it translates to our American friends and our American listenership. So, yeah, that, that transatlantic gap will it be a pond or will it be an ocean um can't wait to find out is that me you want to go to go next <laughs> well yeah sorry yes i'll forget it's my film is that i'm supposed to be master <laughs> of ceremonies so without further ado then joe we can edit that little glitch out joe i would be i'd love to hear your high level summary without giving any scores as to what you thought of this film is that an england you recognize joe what did you make of it oh is that the england that i recognize yeah, we were um, saying when, when you stepped out earlier, this isn't the England of Richard Curtis or Hugh Grant or Rowan Atkinson or Paddington Bear, is it? This is a kind of a gritty, <laughs> sleazy England gone to seed in the late 60s. What, what, what do you think of it? Yeah, when I first was watching it, I was like, what the hell is this? I thought this was supposed to take place in the 80s. And mm -hmm. then I realized it was the 60s or late 60s. Um, so I'm going to tell you, it's kind of a roller coaster of how I viewed this film. I, I really had trouble watching it. It took me about three nights to watch it. Uh, probably a week to watch it. And uh, I hated it at first. Right. So I had to put subtitles on because I couldn't understand half the things that they were saying. <laughs> <laughs> it's just their accents were at times were very thick. And that was a little kind of distracting too because i think part of the charm of this film is you also want to see the expressions of their faces like when they're talking especially you know richard e grant so i finished it and i was like you know i'm gonna watch it again and i did i watched it a second time no subtitles on because i kind of knew what they were saying at this point mm -hmm. and i enjoyed it a lot more i mean i actually did like it i liked it more when they were in the city as opposed to the country and uh it's i i think for me it would have been better off if they if we did get to see these two characters 
lives or what they go through in the city because I you know I liked with nail and I liked I and I liked uh is it Danny is Danny. It the, yeah you know that would have been fun to see him more of him in the the movie although I'm glad he he was still in it towards the end yeah. but um yeah you know and it's funny I, I I think I will revisit the movie again fairly soon too mm -hmm. but my first viewing I was like oh I just can't get through this but it grew on me well, well, fair, fair play, Joe. So I've watched it twice. I think is uh, is you know credit to you. That's great, and I love the fact actually. If, if I suppose you know if you turn around and said to me, uh, I I loved it. It was it was wonderful. Then that that'd be nice, and I'd be appreciative of that. But the fact that you went on a bit of a journey with it, I think, should make some interesting listening to our for our pod. So yeah, can't wait to come back and explore that a bit more with you. Um, I know I know what Charlie thinks about this film. So I have seen it with him, and it was a. Staple of our lives uh, back in the day in Nottingham. So, um, Amanda, Amanda, over to you. Well, um, I was a latecomer to this movie. I hadn't, uh, again, you know, I don't watch a lot of them. Um, <laughs> so, I was a late latecomer to this. I don't remember the first time I watched it. Not too long ago, actually. I think I might. It was with me. Yeah. Yeah, it was with you, wasn't it? A few mm. years back. Um, so yeah this is like the second time i've watched it and i actually did enjoy it the second time a lot more than the first time so i'm with joe on that i think it's a grower um obviously for different reasons i think joe had more, more, more yours was probably more about couldn't understand what they were saying the first time around but then um yeah so i think it's a grower it's one to be watched a few times and I actually quite like it. I was <laughs> chuckling my way through. So, yeah, it's funny. Fantastic. Excellent. And uh, then, over to you then, Charles. Well, it's just... it's. I, I didn't watch it at the time, and I'll tell you why. I didn't watch it because I didn't like the cover. I thought the cover was just off-putting. It, it wasn't... I thought it was one of those, like, the late 80s, and then this is where you and I are going to probably clash a little bit, Dom. The late eighties for British cinema. Yeah. So I think I lumped it all in together with other things that I really didn't want to watch. Was it um, the dartboard cover? No, it was the kind of like um I, I didn't look into this actually, whether or not it was the same artist, but it was it feels like the sort of same artist as the um yes yes minister and yes prime minister. Uh but it isn't him. Um but yeah, I just thought the cover was just you know, it's that's oh, kind of like splatter, the Widnell and I sort of splatter. So I didn't I didn't touch it until I went to university. And at university, everyone's like a, saying all these lines, and I'm like, the hell? This is okay. Oh, these are good lines. Left out. Yeah, well, let's see it in context then. So we all sat down. <laughs> I think that was the first time that I see, saw it was when we sat down as a as a university. I mean, Joe would probably be like a frat house or something like that but we all sat down together and we all watched it and i just went this is this is eccentric uh it's brilliant the characters are done so well it doesn't yes it moves location but it doesn't go all over the place it knows what it wants to do so i want to go to this location then they're going to go over here and then they're going to go back there and and i think the simplicity of it just works in its favor all the time the writing's the writing's fantastic. I mean, I, I I've, every time I watch it, I have a new favourite character, and this time when I watched it, it was Danny, and I was just like, I I just love the character of Danny. I just think he's, I just think he's brilliant. But then I'll watch it again and I'll go, Uncle Monty, because uh, uh, he's just, it it is. And if it's a film that can do that when you watch it, then great. So, yeah. No, I, th I think you're right. I think the characterization is is wonderful. Um, you know, roll call will be slightly shorter than usual, perhaps, on this show because mm. you know there isn't an ensemble cast. I think there's two leads and two other main supporting characters. But the the acting in it, I think, deserves some recognition as well. Surely, a, a all time career highlight for Richard E. Grant in his first ever film. Richard Griffith, just an exceptional actor, and Paul McGann, <laughs> you know, just pulling it out the bag in a way that he. Or no relation to or resemblance to any any later in his in his career, but uh, yeah, tremendous, <laughs> uh, tremendous characterization, tremendous 
uh, acting and, and all stemming from um the director's real life experience so uh, oh, is it? Uh, yeah mm. so um and i know i should know but i can't remember if we do trivia time or uh, roll call first but just touch on trivia time at least the uh, director bruce robinson uh, originally wrote the screenplay based on his kind of itinerant lifestyle in the 60s uh, with a uh, another uh, and he the character of i or um what's he called marlo is it marwood um, marwood marwood is based on him and his flatmate believe it or not richard e grant is based on a real human being for those of us who find that impossible <laughs> oh to, to God, consider really yeah, yeah. that's yeah. amazing yeah a uh, character called vivian uh mccarroll uh, mccarroll uh, with a friend with whom he shared a house in Camden who did indeed once drink lighter fluid um, and went blind for several days off the back of it. So, yeah, it's a <laughs> semi-autobiographical <laughs> story. Wow. Well, uh, you're right. Oh, I'm sorry. It's all right. I've got a dodgy connection on my, on my lead. There we go. I just put a tissue on it. Temperamental. <laughs> Tissues, dodgy innuendos. Anyway, right, okay. Um, <laughs> should we watch the trailer then? And then we yeah, can go. Yeah, go on. Okay, yeah. right, here's the trailer then. To a delightful weekend in the country. You are cordially invited to spend a carefree weekend in the English countryside. Bask in the warm sunshine. We've gone on holiday by mistake. Enjoy the rustic pleasure of country living. It's going to be so cold in here. It's like Greenland in here. Wants to get down there and have sex with those cows. Ah! Partake of fine varietal wine. Oh, drunk. I assure you I'm not, officer. I've only had a few ales. Get in the back of the van! Take lunch at a charming pub. We want the finest wines available to humanity. We want them here, and we want them now. Fraternise with cheery locals. I don't care where you come from! Hans! Experience culinary pleasure. I can make it die. But as you will agree, certain je ne sais quoi about a firm young carrot. Fish in the region streams. <laughs> Threaten me with a dead fish. Whistle and I, a trip worth taking. What absolute twaddle. Um, I don't know what to make of the trailer. If I'd watched that, I mean, I know some people listen, listen to podcasts. We love you, whether you're a listener or a watcher, whatever. But if you'd, there's some good lines in that. Obviously not the best lines, I, I don't think. You've got a few. Um, but yeah, I don't know what I would have made of that trailer if I sat down and watched it. I, I think I think the trailer makes it look like a more traditional film, um, you know, with plot-driven uh, film full of uh, escapades and, and activities mm. such as that. And of course, while there are set pieces and there is a beginning, middle and an end to the film, I think it's more kind of a more of a narrative isn't it more of a look yeah. at their lives a snapshot if you will as opposed to kind of a traditional cinema you know film in, in that sense and so the trailer probably is a bit misleading but then again you can understand why because it's got to succeed commercially and it would be quite hard i think to give an accurate two or three minute summary of what the film actually involves the, the joy of the film i think is getting your teeth into it and exploring the the characters and that probably doesn't lend itself to a slick piece of short marketing mm, true um, should we do roll call? Uh, uh, by the way, before we do roll call, th th this could have a tendency to do what we did with Spinal Tap, which is just start rolling off the uh, the zingers uh, and the belters and the quotable stuff. But please, on this one, feel free. I think anybody that if you're going to listen to a, with, a podcast about with Nile and I, you've got to at least have some some great ones. And I am dying to know in the same way that Dom you were dying to know what Joe thought of the film I'm dying to know what Joe thought of some of those lines and maybe what his favorite ones were if you, if indeed you had some well there, oh, there's only two that I could think of but uh we'll go through it two two okay all right well I don't know the I don't know the definitions that's why I'm yeah that's why I'm here <laughs> that's why we're here Joe that's fine you gotta well, understand Joe wasn't like subjected to your university lifestyle watching the film and everybody quoting it so yeah. Put that into context. Okay. 
and, okay. and for some of our younger listeners, because I, I know we've got quite the, um, the junior uh, demographic following this pod, I think just probably some warnings that we're going to be we'll be dropping some f-bombs on this pod we've got the explicit warning <laughs> lined up i'm i'm I am going to i'm going to utter the phrase monstrous cunt at some point uh, when we're describing the uh, scene with uncle monty and his oh, his out, yeah. burglary. so there we go yeah that's, that's the button off. ticked <laughs> oh my God. there we go <laughs> well at least you warned so it's fine i don't know what youtube thinks about that i might actually get a weird strike for some reason I don't they know. might blank it out I don't think they do well. They do many other things, but I don't think they help you out by blanketing it, blanket it mm. out. But still, AI is listening. Oh, don't don't after the week I've had with AI. Seriously, uh, I'm 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 out, mate. Um, you're in danger of being on the wrong side of this equation. When, I'm not going to be. I'm not going to be. Uh, I I got told how I need to take take an exam, and AI will be watching my what I do on the call on the. One hour forty five minutes to take the exam. It's an open and I, book, and, and he's not I allowed do, to move his head. And I'm not allowed to move my head. So if or I move my head, I fail. If I look down, I fail. I've got to just do this to the camera, like all the time, and then I hope that I get it. And it feels like anyone else in the room, so he can't even ask me the questions, and I can look them up in a book or anything. And if you read them out to yourself, if you go, "What is he think?" It goes fail because you try you're communicating to somebody like that, and I'm like. And at the end of it, when the woman came off and said, that's how we're going to do the exam, I then stuck my hand up and went, does anyone else want to go back to a classroom with a paper book? Because that'd be, that'd be so much good. And yeah. they all stuck their hands up. Oh, Nobody wants this like rubbish. Fun. Nobody wants this rubbish. right? And, and yeah. the, the funny thing is, they've booked you in for the wrong exam anyway. Well, they booked me in for an exam I can't take just yet. So they, they trained me on the old version, and now I'm going to do the exam on the new one. I was like, okay, that's going to be really good. So, so yeah, balls. Never mind balls to Monty. Balls to AI. Uh, seriously, it can go and do one. It still doesn't know what 2010 is. This week's delights. It still has no idea. Duh. Anyway, um, roll call. Let's go to roll call. Let's go and do it. Here's roll call. Roll call. Yeah. So, okay. So, whatever so here that we was. are then. Whatever that roll, was. Roll. Roll call, everyone's favourite part of the pod, and uh, get slightly shorter this time for obvious reasons, in that there are two main leads to the film, Richard E. Grant and Paul McGann. Let, let's start there then. So Richard E. Grant, not everyone's cup of tea, I would suggest, um, and indeed hasn't actually had the kind of illustrious film career one would reasonably expect, so in the UK at least, Joe, I don't know about the States, but he's pretty high profile. He'll, you know, he'll come on to a, a chat show, a TV show, Pretty much everyone will know who he is. But if you look at his filmography, it's slightly lacklustre, I would suggest. What? Oh. What? I'll ask, is, is it actually his name, Richard E. Grant, or is it, is he just put an E in it to be different? Richard Grant sounds like a painter and decorator, doesn't it? But Richard E. Grant sounds a bit like uh, more more thespian, I think, more refined. Thespian. <laughs> Theatrical. Yeah, he's uh right, well, that's distracted <laughs> me. So um So Charlie, well, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna make the case of the defence for Richard E. I am, career, I am, right? I am okay. going to. So, so so let me let me let well, let me give you the intro then. So this was his first major film, first certainly hit. In fact it was his essentially his debut, wasn't it? And what a film to make your debut and you're the star even though it's two leads he's really the kind of prominent prominent lead in it um famously teetotal in real life so had never been drunk uh, and plays a raging alcoholic pretty mm. successfully all the way through this film i think in a different actor's hands he could have been it could have been quite a tedious character or just a comic drunk but he is pretty relentless in this film he's wound tighter than a coiled spring and i think i think he, he gives an absolutely brilliant performance which I would suggest doesn't isn't reflected in his um his later filmography but but charlie over to you what 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 stands out for you well okay so joe predictably let's just get it out of the way of course hudson hawk uh where he plays an equally eccentric character um alongside bruce willis sandra birdhard um and danny aiello uh, i love hudson hawk just simply because it doesn't know what it wants to be i think it's a comedy but it's a bit of everything in there and it's just weird 
um, but a great film to have made. Uh, after this film, he made How to Get Ahead in Advertising. Does anyone remember that film? Yes. He had, he had a growth in the side of his head. Yeah, and it basically overtook his own head. It, it? overtook his own head. So he was, was a, a really nasty character, wasn't he? Yeah. He was um, uh, in L.A. Story with Steve Martin. So I just finished watching that, and he's oh, pretty okay. he's pretty good in that. I kind of like him. I think he's exceptional. I'm sorry. It just seems like every single time we have a podcast, I mention this film, and I have to because there's so many people in it. But he is a set, he is one of the main characters in the player. Uh, so when we talk about, you know, we talked about Robert Altman before. Um, he's one of the, along with Dean Stockwell, who was in um, Quantum Leap. Uh, he was two, the two people making the pitch. And Richard E. Grant was always about, I don't want this to turn into a Hollywood blockbuster. It's a, it's an independent and, you know, it must be. And this is the way it should be. And, um, spoiler alert, he, he, he <laughs> it's a great ending on that one. Uh, he's also in Pretter Porter for his sins. He was in Spice World. Uh, he was Doctor Who. Uh, this is where Joe goes, what? Yes, he played Doctor Who in Cop for Comic Relief in 1999. Uh, period drama for you, Joe, Gosford Park. Uh, he was in Game of Thrones for three episodes. Uh, he was General Pride in The Rise of Skywalker. So he's been in he's been in Star Wars as well. And he was in The Hitman's Bodyguard and the sequel. So you're right, probably not a you know illustrious career, but pops up now and again. And it just makes makes you realise if he's dining out on this film for the rest of his life, I have no problem with that because it's yeah. so good. But I think what what I'd quibble with is that in this film he plays this eccentric, raging, destitute alcoholic. In the rest of his film career, whilst they're not identical roles, there's definitely a theme there, which is that kind of upper class, refined Brit. I'd suggest nothing that really taps into the range and the talent that I think he he displays here. I mean. Joe, you're always my litmus test for this. How familiar were you with Richard E. Grant? Would he be a household name in the States? Obscure? Where, where does he sit on that spectrum? Yeah, he's on like the uh, the spectrum of like a, an Eric Stoltz as a household <laughs> name. <laughs> I couldn't remember the other guy. Who's the other guy? Spacey? Oh, uh, uh, James Spader. James Spader. Or, or the... Andrew McCarthy. You pick one. You, you, you equally have a dartboard for them all, so that's fine. But you know what? Uh, he kind of reminds me of uh, Tim Curry. Oh, no. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. Well, for me. Well, I think so. Pri- privately educated, posh Brit, yeah? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. But, yeah, I think uh, when you look at all the all the roles that he plays, it's, it is, a, it is a, you know, a variation on this theme. Um, this theme? Again, this, this theme... Uh, as he said, posh, you know, upper class type thing. I think you're right. Uh, he's stereotyped in that, apart from the player where he doesn't play that. Um, this is going to be remarkably short. Paul McGann. Well, well, hang on. Before we get on to that, he was oh. Oscar nominated, but I haven't seen the film. And to be honest, if I had a gun at my head, I wouldn't have been able to name it. So, had you ever forgive me, 2018, Grant played Jack Hawk, a role at an Academy Award for the Best Supporting Actor. Um, anyone? No? I didn't. I stopped watching mm-hmm. the Oscars about 2015. <laughs> well, not so much. Do you remember the Oscars from 2018? But do you remember the film? Um, Can you ever forgive me? No. Okay. So it was up no. the gates. It was. It was a pretty. Um, well, we're allowed to swear, aren't we? Piss poor year for the Oscars. So <laughs> oh, uh, that's a curse. <laughs> piss poor. Yeah, I think that's. Yeah, well, you say so you use it as you don't use it as somebody went and got pissed. If someone got pissed, they get angry, don't they? If they got pissed well, over here, it means they're drunk far too much. If, well, if yeah, I, in urine, you know. Urine, yeah. Well, I thought, but I looked at my daughter's homework today, and that was, that could be acceptably described as piss poor. Um, but uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't, I didn't give her that feedback. But uh, yeah, I was not happy. Um, so anyway, 2018, uh, 2019, 91st Academy Awards, the so best supporting actor, Richard E. Grant, Sam Ro- Sam Rockwell for Vice, uh, where he played George W. Bush, uh, Sam Elliott for Star Is Born. Adam Driver for Black KK Klansman, and the winner was Ma Herschel Ali for Green Book. So course, that's why that's, was. that's why we all stopped watching the Oscars <laughs> back in the late uh, <laughs> that, that decade. So yeah, um, I like that movie. I thought that was a good movie. I thought Vice was pretty good. The Dick Cheney uh, biopic that was uh, that's worth watching. Okay, yeah. got a catch you on. Yeah, so Paul McGann. Then um, I suppose in the UK, he's more of a television television actor than a 
than a movie star or film actor. And I guess, Joe, he's sub Eric Stoltz in the States, yeah? Had you ever heard yeah, this guy no, before? No. He reminds me of Roger Daltrey. Oh, okay. poor, poor Roger Daltrey. Somewhere somewhere he's, a, he's having a drink <laughs> or he's out for a meal and he's just shivers and we go, well, some, somebody's just, somebody's just compared me. Compared me to Paul McGann. Why is he bad? Do you think he's bad in this movie? I don't think he's bad in this movie. I just look at his look at what he did after that. The worst, uh, universally regarded as the worst Doctor Who. I mean, it, it, that is a dreadful film, Joe. I mean, it is is appalling. It's incoherent, it's a, rambling mess of a film. It's a film, and it, it's not a series of Doctor Who. That no, Doctor in? Who's a series, but they weirdly they made a they made a film. And cast him as the doctor as the doctor so he's no yes canon. i meant so, so they he's actually canon. made a movie and he yeah. was doctor who okay oh but don't get curious don't don't even even if it's right even if you've only got that film then don't watch it i haven't watched high. doctor who since that guy with the scar from the curly hair that was my last doctor who. oh the the best doctor tom baker yeah oh well, i mean um yeah Chris freckleson's know. pretty good yeah, I don't want to sound like a stereotypical person who works in technology and get embroiled in a Doctor Who debate, which turns <laughs> into a raging argument. But my kids used to like it. David Tennant was an excellent uh, Doctor Who. Matt Smith, oh, uh, The Weeping Angels. Yeah. yeah, what was it called? Blink. That was a great episode. Eh? That's what I think. It, a, I think a tumbleweed it... <laughs> sound effect in there. I well, I didn't. I didn't <laughs> like Matt Smith. I didn't watch anything at any time after that. I've heard it's. Do I've heard Doctor Who just pushing messages at the moment now, so it's just all a bit. Oh, rubbish. Well, yeah. I mean, obviously these days, but um, Amanda, I feel I need to bring you into the conversation here. What What do you think, Paul McGann? Uh, it's all right. Eh? Was he not the guy opposite Harry Enfield? Hey, hey, hey! Calm down. No, that was, was that his brother. There's a different McGann. There's a different one. There's, oh, a, okay. there's a few of them, isn't there? Who was the one that starred in the UK version of Who's the Boss? No idea. Hmm. I mean, Charlie, that is an obscure Don't reference. Even, even That's a great podcast. reference, though. And Joe, Joe gets it, so thanks. But we've missed a movie out with Richard E. Grant in it. Well, go on. Yeah. Okay. Alien so, 3. You what? Alien 3. No, no, no. You probably won't even have heard of this. Now, I remember a few years back, Richard E. Grant and Madonna were very chummy. Do you remember that? How uh, long is that? Is that God, I remember Rupert Everett Madonna being chummy, but not no, Richard E. Grant. Grant. No, Richard was that in the Grant 90s? No, no, 2008. So there was a, a de directorial debut by Madonna in her own film company. I don't think she did many. What? Uh, called Filth and Wisdom. And it was in 2008. It's a British comedy drama. Starring Eugene Hutz, Holly Weston, Vicky McClaw, and Richard and e. Grant. Duty. Yeah. So he was the star. Yeah. So it was filmed on location in London in May 2007. And locations included two actual strip clubs in Hammersmith and Swiss Cottage, both owned by Secret Clubs chain. You lost me at Directed by Madonna. <laughs> that, yeah. <laughs> Let's move on, it everyone. didn't do very well. I like the Oh, really? It, it premiered. <laughs> didn't get very good uh, critic reviews it was released on the uh, 13th of february and went straight to a limited release uh on demand in october so <laughs> it, it didn't do very well at all so that's probably why you didn't mention it but yeah i, I kind of thought oh, no, i know i saw photographs of them like in the papers and in the magazines and stuff and i couldn't understand why but it was because of the film i thought you were implying that they were having sex no, no, I think isn't uh, she probably know, did. Rupert Everett's uh, gay, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, R Richard E. Grant recently lost his wife last year. Oh, did he? And um, talk about it, he, he just can't handle the grief, he's having a real problem with it, and he's oh. can't, a bit like the Ricky Gervais character in Afterlife. He just, oh, bless him. he's just really having a hard time about it. It breaks down, and then something will happen, and he'll post something on Instagram about. So, you know, just seeing something and then suddenly that memory, but instead of just going on, it just reminded me of her. He'll go into detail about it. Um, so, did they have yeah. any kids? 
Oh, Jesus. Look, he's already made it difficult enough for me to do a hilarious podcast off the back of that little interjection. Let's no, I just thought, yeah, it's worth knowing, but... <laughs> All oh, right, okay. And now on with the laughs and listeners, yeah. I'm, I would I'm... like to... No, I'd like to I'll bring it back when you talk about Paul Returns. Um, so, Danny Dyer. Have you ever heard of, Dan, have you heard of Danny Dyer? Oh, I've Dyer? heard of... Yes, I've heard of Danny right. Dyer. Right, okay. So, Danny Dyer did a remake of Run For Your Wife. Right? Um, and it got released. And its takings on its first day was, was how much, Joe? Uh... Probably not a lot if you're going to say that, uh, say it like that. I don't know. Well, you think <laughs> of the average price of a movie ticket and then, you know, how much? Uh, 100,000. Open nationwide, like, yeah. 100,000 pounds or euros or whatever. Yeah, it made 420 pounds. Oh, 420. <laughs> so you wow. can imagine nobody's going to see Daddy Diet. And apparently it is a like a one or two out of 10 film. But under five hundred pound on your opening day, yeah. I think I'm everyone... amazed. Yeah, but I'm amazed. Joe knows who Danny Dyer is uh, over some of the other people we've discussed so far. I mean, he's a professional cockney wanker. That's how I would describe him as being. What, what, what's he? Presents how's the he, wall. How's he crossed the consciousness in the US, Joe? Was it? Was it like uh, did, he mo- did a movie about gangs and soccer hooligans or? Yeah. That's his level, yeah. So it wouldn't yeah. surprise me. He's a, <laughs> he's a, he's and a then he did the sequel. Boy. <laughs> yeah. And then another sequel. And then another sequel. Are you, um, are you, a, fan, are you a fan of those, Joe? Those uh, bit of yeah. violence on the terraces? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm fascinated with the soccer hooligans. Really? Know. I mean, oh, I was it the they, football they... factory? Was that... Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's it. Right, okay. No, that they, they, they would risk, you know, going to jail over or a football team you know but that they would even commit murder if they had to mm. over a football well, team in which they in which vinnie jones and eurotrip probably did yeah <laughs> <laughs> they just haven't found the body yet <laughs> so going back to paul mcgann then i remember him as the monocled mutineer Oh, good Lord. You watched your mum's shows when you were... You didn't watch any pro- proper films, but well, you I sat down and watched, I, didn't have I don't know, Prime Suspect telly. or Midsummer Murders or something. I didn't have control of the telly. So you had to sit and watch Boone, which we'll get yeah, to in Yeah, I did, moment. actually. I watched Boone. Yeah. Boone was quite good fun watching that with my mum. Right, okay. It's true. We've lost well, this into generational bonding now. It's all kids on Snapchat and TikTok and uh, Zero. I get I get tagged in on one thing that they find amusing every two weeks, and that's that's the extent of our cultural connections these days. Um, being forced to watch <laughs> being forced to watch Bergerac on a Sunday night. That's that's what it's all about, isn't it? That's, oh God, yeah. what, do you, what do you expect when you say your daughter's homework is piss poor to the world? Oh, yeah. that's what I thought. I did. Oh yeah, I suppose. Well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I kept it to myself. I kept it to myself until until now. Um, Yes, let's move on. Let's move on to let's move on to Ralph Brown, aka drug dealer Danny, who's actually got a pretty illustrious film career for somebody who I wouldn't have been too familiar with. So, uh, with an LI big breakthrough role, also in Wayne's World Two, plays one of the uh, roadies there. Plays Alien. the same character. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly yeah. the same character. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, but he's less. Um, all right, the crime game. He's the um, soldier in the crime game, isn't he? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Memorable film. Well, with Paul McGann, he was in Alien 3. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was uh, 85. In 85. Do you know why yeah. he was called 85? No. No? Joe, do you remember? Nope. That was supposed to be the, his, uh, the score he got on his IQ test. So he is quite a he is quite a lovable character, but as much as you can have lovable characters in a film about an alien on, on the loose in a prison col- colony on a on the planet but yeah but but um, his, stand, his standout role that most people are listening to this puddle known for is he was hatchet harry wasn't he locked stock and two smoking barrels uh, it wasn't actually harry he was it wasn't, wasn't. He? that was <laughs> oh, that was um uh um uh, moriarty he was in the long good friday in jaws three Charlie, why don't, why don't you uh, oh, uh, burnish us with your reminiscence of him while I just do some Googling <laughs> uh, in a moment. Uh, uh. I will say, since he's Googling, I really needed subtitles for that guy. 
Cool, yeah, cool it, your jets, cool your jets, man. He uh, he wasn't in lock, stock, and two smoking barrels. So no. we're just, <laughs> just <laughs> this is this is why I should never be allowed to do uh, the leading when it's my <laughs> film on rock call. So uh, who are you getting mixed up with then? Yeah, the, uh, it's, it's the guy out of Jules, the guy out of Jaws three. Right, governor, let's go and uh, let's go and kill this beast. No. Why um, Do you remember watching Lock, Stock, Two Smoking Barrels? The guy that rigs the poker game in the boxing ring. Yeah, that's right. With the moustache. <laughs> yeah. No. Not the big guy. Not Big Lenny McLean, Governor. The other guy. You owe me two hundred now, boy. No. Oh. The only one okay. I remember is is the old guy with the sort of uh, wears like the camel coat all the time. That's Lenny. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway, right, sorry, John. Yeah. Well, that, that's uh, done my credibility a lot of good when it comes to trivia time. Uh, our listeners will be sitting well, there. Well, Joe's going to. Uh, so can I just say that it was good to see him back as Del Preston in Wayne's World 2 because he just, again, played the same character and was equally as funny as he is in this film um, and lifts that film. I, I actually prefer Wayne's World 2 to the first one, which I know is probably heresy, but I, I preferred it. Um, uh, is uh, Alien 3 uh, Armistad, so he's worked with Spielberg. Uh, the British TV series Nighty Night, which is one of the darkest comedies I think I've ever seen. Oh, God, that's yeah. mental. With Have Junior you seen Davis. that, Joe? Nope. Oh, oh, you should. You need to somehow, Disturbing. somehow, Joe, find a way to uh, find a way to watch that. All right. Um, he was in Agent Carter, uh, uh, but he was uh, one of the pilots in Phantom Menace. At the end, where they're launching the attack, the, the very lackluster attack on the uh, that ring thing, wherever it was, new gun ray sh- ring ship. I'm sure it's got a proper name to it, but I don't care. I'm surprised he's still alive because I would assume someone that played a character like that was a character like that. Or had experience with all. No, but he's not there. though, because when you look he's at not? him in the other roles, no, he's not like that at all. He's very calm. He's very mild mannered, and you know, you think he wouldn't say "boo to a goose," as they say. I don't suppose you get that reference. Not that no. we do. I don't know what. Boo to a goose. Why would you say "boo to a goose"? <laughs> don't know. Especially Just... not at Christmas because you want to kill the goose and get it in your oven. No, but the phrase is supposed to be that you're too shy, so you can't say "boo to a goose." But even if you were effervescent and extrovert, why would you go up to a goose and go, boo? Well, you would if it was pecking at your toes or pecking at your your bits or something. If it was coming out. No, you wouldn't you. say boo to it. You'd be wringing its yeah. neck. Yeah. Well, you might go, boo, like that or something. I don't know. <laughs> so there's a scenario where somebody does say boo to the goose. Clearly. Right, okay. That's coming up in AI, isn't it? Yeah, AI, AI is going to have a field day with that what? one. What? Yeah, I was going to say that. Yes, <laughs> chat GPT. Are doing what with the goose? They're talking about geese. They're, they're looking. How birds fly? Geese. Yeah. <laughs> um. Anyway, yeah. Should we move yeah. on? Because we're let's in danger of staying in roll call for. Yeah. Well, this is the last one I think. Um. Because the rest of the cast were fairly oh, I've minor. Got, I've got to have another couple on the end. But yeah, go oh, on. Okay. All right. Well, Richard Griffith. So. Famous uh, to most of our listeners as, and I'm on firmer ground here, Uncle Vernon in the Harry Potter series of films. So the uh, big bloke at the start of those. Um, But what I'm most uh, associating with is the the best play that I've ever seen in my life, which is also a really great film as well, which is The History Boys. If anyone's ever seen that. uh, No. No? no. no? Oh, wow. Sounds interesting there. Really, really, really good. So basically a... um, teacher in a boys school uh kind of upper i think it's the private school or at least it's the kind of the, the brightest of the school centered around history but explores themes growing up sexuality as well um got a uh, good ensemble british cast james corden was in it before he lost his way and became um a legend in his own lifetime and his u.s chat show but richard griffiths uh, francis de la tour uh just perfect performances so yeah history boy is well worth checking out uh if it's ever on the stage again over tours but certainly the, the film is so yeah harry potter with their light also in make a gun two and a half oh, smell of fear smell of fear yeah yeah who, who yeah. was he there was he the guy in the wheelchair yeah yeah that's right yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay 
I I particularly liked him as Terrace number three in Superman two. Uh, was he? Was he? Yeah. In the Eiffel Tower, yeah. You see the priming the bomb. <laughs> yeah. And if you look at him there, and then you look at him five years later, with Dan and I, I'm like, did you just go on a? Uh, did you just eat everything in sight? Because you're quite, quite slim and quite, you know. He ate a lot um, of gooses. Yeah, he said did say boo to them. Um, but yeah, he was in the uh, he was in one of the Pirates of the Caribbeans too. Was he? Oh, okay. On Stranger Tides. Hmm. Oh, okay. Right. Twenty eleven. He was also I'm in that comedy, it. that comedy classic, King Ralph. He was so, also in uh, Chariots of Fire, A French Lieutenant's Woman, Gandhi. Um, yeah, and some other films. He's he's a he's a proper actor though. He's a, an, an actor's actor, actor, I think. He yes. is, yeah, mm. definitely. Yeah. He's, he's got, uh, he had an yeah. OBE, didn't he? Yeah, I know. And I think he's. I think he's great in this in this film as well. I think he's, uh, his performance is, is wonderful. Uh, did you know he died uh, actually not far from from us? Uh, he died in Coventry in 2013. I guess you were... feel free feel free to do Coventry as much Coventry bashing as you want to. That it's designed to be. What did he die uh, of? D- disappointment. He's actually <laughs> buried. He's buried in a Warwickshire village, Bearley. Well, barely B E A R L E Y. So, in our county, <laughs> the, the Germans try to flatten Coventry, and it's like, anytime you want to come back, <laughs> just just let us know. Finish the job. Finish no, the job. Don't, don't put Coventry down. It's had a lot of um, investment again now. It's mainly what, so it's now got two chip shops, Woo-hoo! like accommodation now, like all posh accommodation. You know, uh, managed apartments and stuff mm. for students. Yeah. Do we have any listeners from Coventry? Probably. Have they discovered radio? Yeah. Have they? Have they actually <laughs> managed to? Of course they did. Do me now. You had Marconi up up the road in near Coventry. Mark 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 Oni. Marconi. Yeah, it was a company. Telecom's Did he play the Mamba? Company. Listen to the radio. Telecom's company <laughs> in New. Oh, God. <laughs> oh man. All right, good. Very good, everyone. King King Ralph. Can we have a thing for King Ralph? Matt, tell me what King Ralph's about. Give me, give me. It was, it was John Goodman. The royal family died, and the only the living person that was a relative was a distant relative, and it was John Goodman, the guy from he used to be in Roseanne. Oh yeah, big guy. Yeah, so he played King Ralph. So he came over here and was a brash American doing the royal stuff, and it was passable rubbish. Rodney Dangerfield was unavailable for that film, presumably. Yeah. But uh, yes, yeah, so <laughs> oh, would, would have made it much better. A yeah. much better film. <laughs> yeah. Damn, <laughs> that's a great idea. Um, but anyway, yes, you're right. Can I just finish off with the other two? Um, yeah. uh, Michael Elphick, obviously. Give us, Ooh. give us a wee, give us a weasel on that fag. Um, fag, obviously, to say it's a cigarette. A cigarette. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so Google's algorithms. I know you're watching, listening, wherever. Uh, the Elephant Man, who's in Quadrophenia. Uh, the ill fated uh, Monty Python spin off, if you can call it, Privates on Parade. Uh, it was in Kroll Buddy Song. So there's your Roger Daltrey uh, little bit in there. Uh, and obviously, he was in Boone. And I didn't know until last night he was in EastEnders because I don't yeah, watch well. EastEnders. Uh, the last one, Joe, this one's for you. The black guy that was in the flat. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Chanted. yeah, yeah. Right. Where's he from, Joe? <laughs> was he from Live and Let Die? I don't know. No, he was. He's in Pink Floyd's The Wall. He's in Raiders of the Lost Ark. He plays a messenger in Raiders of the Lost Ark. But, Dom, uh-uh. he's, he's Chocolate Moose in Top Secret. Right, okay. No, I, um, I'm afraid I... I didn't do my research on him. He, he was a rather unfortunate character in this film, wasn't he? Referred to pretty much exclusively by a racial slur. And um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he's yeah. in the bath and then he's toking away on a big joint and chanting. That, that's basically his contribution. So no, I didn't, uh, didn't, <laughs> didn't do my research there, I'm afraid. Yeah, you can swear. I swear as much as you like, but we can't delve any... Uh... No, some of us have yeah. careers that we need to preserve, <laughs> don't we? So, yeah. um, anyway, so there's Roll Call, I would say. 
Here's my notes for, for with Nail and I. I just put in egg butties and the cat. Those are, those are my only notes. Are we not doing, tri- are we not doing trivia time? So I've got a bit of trivia uh, for this one. Well, should we want to do the film and then do a bit of trivia? We've got about All half right. an hour left. Yeah, do that. Yeah, Let's yeah, get I'd, the I'd questions. Oh, okay. Oh, well, fire away with you. Well, look, we don't let us be, you know, nailed right, to one format. Let's, Joe, let me, what are your questions, mate? What's a pants? It's uh, a perfumed a, a gay, a gay guy. It's oh, okay. A male gay. Yeah. I thought I thought it was somebody who used prostitutes, but um, that's not no. right, then, though. No. Okay. So if you say I, somebody, that's I mean, a nonce. No, no, nonce is um, even worse, isn't it? A nonce is somebody who likes uh, underage uh, people. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, ponce but, meaning a pretentious, affected or, or yeah, feminine man. Um, yeah, like Quentin Crisp. Or, or so, actually, this this is why I got confused. So, or it's a man who lives off prostitutes' earnings. So like the, the male equivalent yeah. to a to a madam, perhaps. So ponce, yeah. It's a I classic eighties insult that should be revived. I think. Yeah, I, I would have said thank you if that's what the definition was. <laughs> right. Yeah. What well, if you were? <laughs> Do we start calling you a ponce pin- then from now on, Joe? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> Just because he spilled essence of petunia on his on his shoes. <laughs> but Joe, you could get away with weaving that into US US life because they would have no idea. Ponce, nonce. You can... Oh, I think they know what a nonce is. Do they? No, we've never heard of not that. What's, well, you've what's got nonce? enough. Of, you've got enough of them in Hollywood, so. <laughs> oh. Ooh. Ouch. Not so naming any names. Underage boys. <laughs> Oh, that's what really? not naming any names, but or just girls, while we're here, I know we're going to pick nineties yeah. films. No Forrest Gump allowed. So yeah, it's fine. Okay, and, let's move on. And they had ordered cider. Is that? It looked like beer. Is that beer? Uh, I had a, oh, I had a note on, I had a note on this because me and Charlie, when we were in Nottingham, went through a phase of drinking uh, iced cider. And I remember one night in particular, do you remember, Charlie, when we got absolutely battered at the Arboretum, I think it was? Um, oh, God, that's the that's the cider place of choice, yes. Oh, my goodness, yeah. Because when you drink ice cider, it, it just conf- it confuses you. It doesn't taste that alcoholic, does it? It's just like really hot day. You've got to drink on a hot day, ice cider, banging it back in the park, probably going as red as a lobster, try and stand up, leg- legs have gone. Vaguely remember a taxi ride home sleep on charlie's lounge floor um yeah god i was not well that's uh the fact two days afterwards but yeah happy happy days but yeah traditionally it's um, i couldn't remember getting a taxi so you've got oh one up on god. me i can't remember if that was a night that i never had a fight with um what was he called mark williams do you remember or was that a separate party oh, ev- you should, ev- everyone should have a fight with mark williams but yeah yeah mark if you're listening twat to this day um <laughs> time, times two no love lost there then. Damn, oh, I gotta meet up, this guy. Up until this point, we cut to Mark Williams listening to this now going, Oh, I found them so entertaining. I, I, what, why, 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 why don't they like me? I thought it was all water under the bridge. Yeah, no. I'm unsubscribing. No, I am. <laughs> 25 okay, you've years never met Mark Williams. Harbour yeah. of Grudge. Yeah. If so, you Joe, like do you know that, what cider is? Joe. No, that's what I was trying to figure out. Is it it's apple crunch. cider? It's, it's, uh, is it, yeah, it's, it's um, alcoholic apple juice basically yeah uh, oh, okay with fizz in it you don't have cider in the states uh maybe we do i, I mean i think didn't Magnus. bob cratchit he used to drink a lot of cider uh, oh god <laughs> now we're going the only, the only the only way i know about it is it's in a christmas carol yeah okay it's it's quite popular drink a festival drink over here it's it's traditionally made in the devon and Somerset counties, uh, which is towards if you look at the UK, it's towards the leg end on the left. But would, would that get you hammered though? Yeah, oh god, yes, yeah. as, as we uh, dominate just grumpy cider, or, or even like the um manufactured cider, which has never ever seen an apple with names like white lightning and those sorts of drinks, white ciders, it's Trump, Trump's choice basically. So, yeah. yeah, I'm sure with nail, um after his descent into destitution would have been on cheap manufactured synthetic cider. It's just about the worst thing. It's a, in terms of cost to getting hammered, it's the best ratio you can find. That's why Trump's yeah. there so much. And if you go if you go down to Devon or Somerset, you can have 
it, it's rare that you'll find sparkling cider because they just like they love still. It's still still basically. cider is dangerous because then you go, what percentage is this? And they go, don't know. I don't know. Around nine. They've made it, and you can just <laughs> buy it in the in liter tub uh, like tubs and things. Oh my god, it's it's horrendous. And I drank knee, knee trembler. It was called. Yeah. Knee was it knee trembler? That's a good name. I think it's, uh, yeah. No, it was uh, Leghorn, wasn't it? Leg, no, leg bender. Leg bender. That was, that was it, it. Yeah. So I was yeah. drinking a, I was drinking a bender's drink. This, this uh, pod's already come up with a couple of potential titles for my autobiography. Knee Trembler, or what was it you said earlier? That Madonna film what was that called Filth and Wisdom? Yeah. yeah. Either, <laughs> either of those would be suitable. So I'm just going <laughs> to make some, make some notes. I think. Any other questions, Joe? Before we delve delve into the. Yeah, is Chin Chin an actual toast? Oh yes. yes. Chin oh yeah, chin chin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've heard cheers, but I yeah. never heard yeah. chin chin. Yeah, it's an old British thing. Um, okay. Your good, your good health. Um, uh, an, an old one, but I think it's just relevant <laughs> to me. Um, take the chrome off your bike. Uh, if you were drinking a shot, you'd say that. What is Amanda laughing at? I have no idea. She was, she, she was just going through a few traditional English. Uh, toasts and just well no pun intended inserted up your bum in there uh i think you tried to get away with it but that's definitely not one that i ever used to use at christmas i've never heard that as a it's supposed to be yeah. bottoms up but i can't oh yeah okay i see that. <laughs> yeah i said the wrong thing <laughs> right okay so chin chin joe what, what else can we help with that's it for now i mean that's all i can okay. think of i mean i just don't understand what their logic was though uh you know, like they they basically were a bunch of alcoholics, I, I would assume, and then they just got bored in the town that they lived in, so they went to somewhere else where. Well, I think they were really them. cold. I think they just wanted to, a holiday with <laughs> with somebody else paying for it and stuff. I mean, the the plot is that they're uh, actors who are unsuccessful, so yeah. in between work is the euphemism is, and so they have this life of poverty and destitution. Which is in and and of course Richard E. Grant in particular is a is an alcoholic and uh, and they keep themselves going between trips to the pub. So I thought the film starts really well introducing that. I mean the seediness and the griminess of late sixties working class London's brought to life. You, you mentioned it earlier, Charlie, when they go to, when the I character goes to the cafe and see you see that shot of the eggs frying in fat mm. and then that old woman between two slices of disgusting looking bread just bites into it and it all drips out it's um yeah, yeah and that kind of sets the scene for the rest of the film but they're 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 flat that they live in the kitchen full of um Mat matter matter yeah rats <laughs> suspected rats um it doesn't look like it's had any fairy liquid in there for a while does it and uh and and, and so it starts just focused on uh, the paul McGang character and it's only Afterwards, that uh, Withnail enters, obviously totally hungover, and um, I feel dreadful. So do I. So does everyone. Look at my tongue; it's like it's wearing a yellow sock, and that's uh, that's how he's kind of introduced. <laughs> I just think that that kind of the script, the writing throughout the film is is brilliant, and it and it just carries on. He talks about um, Jeff Wode, the Jeff Wode. Uh, weightlifter who's been on steroids. Um, yeah, uh, he used to give him bad tempers and act up, said his wife. He used to pick on me, but now he's stopped. He's so much better in our sex life and in our general life. Um, Jeff Wode is feeling better and now prepared to step back in society and start tossing his orb around. Look at him. Look at Jeff Wode. His head must weigh 50 pounds on its own. Imagine the size of his balls. Imagine getting into a fight with a fucker. <laughs> yeah. There's a level of richness there that, uh, that I, think is, I think is brilliant. I'm going to rip your head off because I don't like you. Yeah. <laughs> Drinking, uh, drinking coffee from a soup bowl. Um, the the line, the line where <laughs> for kids, um, he delivered that line, and as soon as he delivered that line, the director went, "That's how I want that. That's how I've always envisaged the line to be said, and that's how he got the role." Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's, it's brilliant. The um the performance from right right from the start, I think, and uh, just the it, it makes you feel a bit queasy a bit funny watching it to live imagine living like that in that level of filth and disgust Walla, yeah and then and then but they're just they're just biding the time until they go to the pub i'm just wondering where's all the money coming from because they, yeah. like they haven't got anything well they were signing on weren't they did you know what that was joe signing on is that like kind of like unemployment 
Yeah, it's an employment benefit yeah. called the dole back then. The do- I've heard of the dole. Yeah, so yeah. Um, you had to basically register uh, every, it was either every week or every two weeks, probably every week, wasn't it? You had to queue up and register uh, and prove that you weren't eligible to work or had been applying for jobs but hadn't been successful, etc., etc. Mm. So, yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that you had to prove it. I thought they just gave it to you. No, 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 no. Well, I think probably back in the sixties it was a bit easier, wasn't it? They've they've tightened up um, since then. But yeah, but mine they... mine was great when I went to my local dole when I came back from university and went and signed on and did it myself. Uh, they were like going, "So what are you? Edu-? Well, I've got a uh, I've got a BTEC, I've got HND in business and finance, and I've got a two uh, I've got a bachelor honors degree in marketing." And they're like, "Yeah, do you want to go and pick apples?" Or do you want to go and like work in... <laughs> no 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 i don't i'd like a job in marketing she's like this is ultra street where are we going to find you anything like that well i'm just going to keep coming back then and uh and i did <laughs> is that apple <laughs> job still available <laughs> did you did you descend into this lifestyle as well then charlie so killing four hours to get to the pub by no because i volunteered because yeah. I volunteered at my mum and dad's public school, girls' public school. Oh, and that's another uh, podcast all in itself. Did. Yeah, okay. You, I think I told you a few stories from that. So, yeah. You lived there, though, didn't you? I did. I, I did live. I was the only boy, the only living boy in New Cross. I was the only boy in living there. And I, I didn't stay in mum's flat. I actually stayed out with the girls in sixth form. I mean, it was every boy's dream, really, to be did fair. Did you do anything? I'm like, uh, uh, come I, on, Amanda I shared quite quite a lot of insight into oh, that's, uh, uh, that's, her formative that's experiences. That's her. Week. That's her to prefer to. Uh, yes, yes, is the, is the simple answer. You naughty, naughty boy. Did I? Yeah, I did. You betrayed um, your mum's trust. Uh, how, uh, how often? But she didn't Amanda. know. She, but she didn't know. So had so it's no betrayal. I like that logic. It? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you see it? No, it didn't happen. <laughs> there you go. Well, so that's it, is it? I can't help but feel you've skirted over some. Well, because I, I have little, to skirt it? over. It's quite yeah. Well, well, considering I'm just telling Amanda now. I mean, at least give me the give me, give me yeah. the courtesy of like six four oh, over uh, six four bothered. over sixteen, aren't they? So I'm interested. Go on, tell mm. us then. How many times were you? Uh... Right, not, so there was a, cool. there was a, um, I, if they, if they had, I wasn't allowed to go to the sixth form ball. So I used to amuse myself by going to the computer center um, there. So because I did that, all the girls knew that I went to the computer center. And so all the girls that like Mrs. Hunter were like, oh, let's go and see uh, Charlie, little Charlie um, in, <laughs> in there. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I didn't get. I didn't get that name, Charlie. I'm imagining the computer center was like. Have you seen that Sharon Stone's film Sliver? He's just got a bank of screens for all the hidden cameras that he's squirreled oh, away yeah. in this skill sick form. Yeah. Yes. Because the, compu- yeah, the computing yeah. power of uh, BBC Micros at that time was enough to uh, to give me that. Uh, the uh, <laughs> so is that where the dudes computer then, that in I the computer need. center? That's where some of them started. Yeah. Wow. So, so so I'm going to call it a layer because I think that's probably the best way best way to describe what you're dis- discussing here, Charles. So, you, so you're, you're ensconced in your layer, yeah. Yeah, and they just they just come from in, the girls. they come in dressed just dressed to the nines and be like, oh, yes, yeah, so you're, you're uh, uh, hi, I'm Kirsty. She was probably the best out of the lot. Sarah McDougall, who I ended up going out with Don't for a name while. Names. No, no, I'm fine. I'm <laughs> fine with it. I won't name Kirsty. I went to see Lethal Weapon two with her. And we went out on a date, um, and I just couldn't keep my hands off her. So yeah, um, it's funny. I, I'm actually, not going into any more detail now. I mean, you know, what do you want? I thought little Charlie was code for your penis. <laughs> well, <laughs> little Char- little Charlie got you know got it's well like, looked after. Don't worry. I'm going to see little Charlie. <laughs> I'm not sure I could have done it in the computer. I'm not sure I could put it in the computer room. Let me just tell you what the computer room looked like. It was a shining like beacon where you couldn't see out, but you could definitely see in. So if little Charlie made an appearance, I would have been the police would have been called, I'm sure, or something, or one of the dads that turned up in their Merc or their Ferrari or something. 
I bet if they shone one of those ultraviolet torches around that computer room after oh, you finished their chat. <laughs> yeah. Wait a minute. So you're talking about like mid mid to late eighties porn? <laughs> no, what, no, what? not porn. But, so, no, so, no, real do you life. Remember, you remember mid to late eighties porn? Loading, loading. He's loading. on about oh, real good. life, not porn. <laughs> Right, okay. Well, any, the ladies do, shall we move away? Because we do have a podcast to do, after all. <gasps> okay, it's confessions, okay. isn't it? Yeah. We should have a little section confessions. I've done some, haven't I? Oh, uh, I, you have did, probably loads, Joe I don't know. Some. Yeah. Dom? Joe's, Joe's in some of yours. Well, I don't know. I, don't know. I, th I, I thought we were in a safe space here. So that we could talk about these things. And... It's a safe space. Oh. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's feel free, that... Charlie. Yeah, because, uh, <laughs> you know... Just unburden yourself, oh. yeah? Um, no? Right. So let's move on. Okay. Right. Okay. Hi. How disappointing. All right. So I think we've gone to the bit in the film where he slathered himself in deep heat in order to keep himself warm. <laughs> He's, uh, and that's when the lighter fluid scene happens. Oh, With the classic line, even the wankers on the site wouldn't drink that. It's worse than meth. Nonsense. That's far superior drink to meth. The wankers don't drink it because they can't afford it. And... Um, and as I said in my trivia time uh, earlier, that was based on a real life scene where the with now character Vivian McCarroll did drink lighter fluid and went blind for several days. Um, That's afterwards. horrendous. Yeah. And trivia, trivia time, uh, they practiced with water, but when they were going to do the, the full scene, he put vinegar in it. So his reaction is because he wasn't expecting vinegar. Oh, God. Mm. Didn't they also uh, give him alcohol? They did, yeah, because in real life, uh, Richard E. Grant was teetotal. In fact, I think with an actual allergy to alcohol as well. So for those reasons, uh, the director thought it would be impossible for him to be inebriated and hung over in the way. So they did force him to go out on the lash in London and um, took him on a drinking binge. Grant has stated that he was violently sick after each drink and found the experience deeply unpleasant. But uh, yeah, it's remarkable that he puts in that performance not being an experienced yeah. boozer, I think. Mm. But that, that does get us onto the. Um, oh, sorry, it's a classic payoff line there, isn't it? Uh, after he's uh, tried to get some antifreeze from the Marwood character, which is, you bloody fool, you should never mix your drinks. It falls yeah. on the floor, <laughs> vomits everywhere, which which requires the um, the perfume on the boots. So then go to this London boozer, like like real pubs used to be, according to some people, but like pubs when they were absolutely horrible. There was no, no women in there for a start, no. no music, just people sitting there bitterly staring into their pints. Well, it was when an it was IRA support. IRA pub, wasn't yeah. It? yeah. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, drinking ice cider is again. Um, and then the word ponce is used, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> I could hardly piss straight with fear. <laughs> Any more masculine than him, <laughs> you'd have to live up a tree. Um, yeah. What did he read on the wall in the toilet? He fucks asses. Oh, that's it. And the arses. Which, which, and he has this internal monologue, doesn't he? Yeah. About oh, that know, was family panicking. toast though back in back in the day, wasn't it, Amanda? No, eh? Hey? Wasn't that the family toast back in the day? Fucking that arses. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and then he comes out, and it's perfume punts. And then it comes my one of my favourite lines, which is, "What fucker said that?" <laughs> <laughs> which is just, I mean, it's just played perfectly. It's said perfectly. It's great. And then my sec one of my second favourite lines, which is, I, I have a heart condition. If, if you hit me, it's murder. <laughs> my wife's having a baby, yeah. My wife is having a baby. <laughs> you know, again, it, it, it's funny. I wasn't crazy about it, but I, I can't stop laughing. Just, you know, what you guys reminiscing about what, what went on, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty funny. And then it's back. It's back to the flat, isn't it, for the encounter with Danny uh, Headhunter, yeah. Yeah. guy, uh, the doll which uh, doll which shits itself, and his little business oh, schemes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think my favourite interaction in the whole film is this bit though, when when Danny and with now start to um, argue, and uh, this, it goes, "Don't get tight with me, man, because if you do, I'll have to give you a dose of medicine. Give if I dose. spike you, <laughs> you'll know you've been spoken to." You wouldn't spike me. You're too mean. Besides, there's nothing invented I couldn't take. If I medicined you, you'd think a brain <laughs> tumor was a birthday present. <laughs> it's just fucking brilliant, isn't it? Balls, yeah. I could do double what you, what yeah. you could do. <laughs> yeah, quality. Uh, and, and yeah, uh, 
yeah, a brain tumor was a birthday present. That's uh, that's a line that's uh, cropped up. Uh, ha- hair follicles. Today. That's why bald people are so uptight. <laughs> yeah, that's, you can do that better good. than I can. Yeah. <laughs> I just remember him saying, "It's called the embalmer." That's, that's it, good. the embalmer. <laughs> Two quid. <laughs> anyway, so move, moving on a little bit because we do. They go to the they go to see Uncle Monty to get free booze free money uh and the key to the uh his holiday home in the lake district yeah drive to penrith bit of Jimi hendrix all along the watchtower blaring out some good good tunes in this uh, isn't the motorway clear (sighs) no it's great look at that just just casually drinking sherry from a bottle no seatbelts on no (laughs) those are the days eh yeah um, Jimi Hendrix trivia trivia fans, uh, the Jimi Hendrix estate uh, saw this film and took back control of the songbook um, because they didn't they kept they were really pissed off at people at films using his um, uh, using his songs when everyone was taking drugs or drinking, so they wanted to change. And I'm like going, I think that genie's already out of the bottle. You ain't going to get that back in. It's like saying, well, we'd rather not Creedence Clearwater Revival be used for Vietnam films, if that's okay. <laughs> Too late. Too late. But that but that, that moves the plot on, doesn't it? From the, the kind of first half an hour, we, I, know, I know we need to speed up a bit, which kind of spills the characters, gets, the, gets them established, and then they spend a chunk of time in the country, which I know, Joe, you weren't as fond of, but they're very, very quickly out of their um, depth, falling out with everyone unable to survive and provide basic provisions having to burn the furniture we might as well sit around a cigarette for the warmth that it gives them that's it that's, that's a brilliant line we've, we've got on holiday by mistake which uh, is a great line and the michael elphick character best known as boone uh to uk listeners um you won't work it on boy yeah fantastic <laughs> fantastic um the, the the bedroom scene where they are in the double bed together and they think that he's breaking in which <laughs> is is uh, Uncle Monty but that it, it's funny it's well acted the, the, the terror in their eyes as they're uh, as he's coming up the stairs sharpening sharpening the knife as they uh, as they think he's doing that's um oh my boys my boys forgive me Monty you <laughs> terrible sea bomb I don't want to get us banned from the uh oh we've already said it yeah, you know? did already say it <laughs> <laughs> maybe it needs two strikes <laughs> get banned <laughs> And then he's and then he sorts about doesn't he? So uh, they 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 see how I think the pub, civilized I think people the, live. The pub scene. So Joe, usually that the old boy behind the bar that was just helping himself to, to the booze. Basically, no, that's how he run his ran his pub. Um, do you remember, man? There used to be that that documentary or something that we we watched about a guy who owned a bar, and he kept saying. Oh yeah, in the morning I'll have a few liveners, to, liveners to uh, to warm to start the day, and by liveners he meant he meant about half a bottle of scotch before lunchtime. And oh, you're like, I said so that's where that guy, you know, that that would be a pub in Penrith. The police would leave him alone. Yeah, there would be well, a lock in the police are every probably night. Like going in for a fight yeah, yeah. anyway. So you'd have like a lock in, which is when you go past the time that you should close. Um, and then they just finish whenever, because there'd be nobody there to. Nobody would complain. The police would never come, as, as Man said. They'd probably be there themselves, and everyone would drive, drive drunk. Yeah. The sixties, oh, the sixties, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, brilliant, brilliant scene. The poacher, the um, the barman. Um, yeah, but I, I do like. I think Monty's uh, reintroduction into the plot does liven things up as well he's i think he's uh his performance throughout this is is excellent and the <laughs> the, the predatory homosexual tendencies he brings to towards the um the the eye character the paul mcgann character is is hilarious <laughs> the de- desire he has from him but and the reluctance it, but you you've got to say that if if he didn't come out with that i'm in love with Widnail line um uncle monty would have raped him yeah, he's a borderline rapist. Yeah, he would have just. There's no way that he's getting out of that. 
So he, he was thinking on his feet, to be fair. It's sweet, though. Surely he's a bit sweet? harsh. Sweet. I should have just <laughs> gave him one. Give him a tug. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <yeah. laughs> he has given you his house for the uh, for the week, isn't he? So I'm preparing myself to forgive you those those little lines, yeah. But that's what Richard E. Grant admits. I've made up all this stuff so that we could get the key. So if I, essentially, he's already sold him out anyway. I love the bit where he's on the on the on the couch, where he's on the couch, and he's like, "Are you? Are you no, 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 are you sure? No, I need to go to my room." <laughs> in that trunk. <laughs> Suddenly, the agreement that they made is all out the window, all gone, and yes, you, you are not in the room with a lock on the door. <laughs> his, when he's in bed and, and he hears the door getting forced, and he just shuts his eyes in, in fear. That's it. It's, it's really well. Because of a toilet trader, doesn't he? And yeah, I mean to have you, even if it's burglary. That's um, <laughs> not what you want to be hearing at two o'clock in the morning. No. Oh, Barry. Uh, um, so yeah, I think the I think all the countryside's done really well. That, that's exactly how people. That's exactly how you'd expect them them to behave. Probably the country to behave. She goes out. He goes when he goes looking for food. When he goes down to that that hut, and the woman opens it. She would. She, that's exactly how she'd behave. Yeah. And you think, yeah, this is. Did you Did you guys ever kill a chicken? No. No. I haven't. I hasn't, <laughs> he hasn't said anything yet. No, no, no. I'm, I'm no, not not keen on killing animals. Why, Joe? Have you Have you killed a chicken? No, I haven't. But my nan used to work on a farm. So oh, my, and she did. My my dad's mum. Uh, she worked on a farm. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't unheard of. It was a normal thing, really. Wring a chicken's neck, pluck it. it. So, so like, it like throttling cock, then. <laughs> Whoa, oh, sorry, back. no. Whoa, sorry, is. He's no. back. I have, to, I have to get your prim and proper on his, uh, his sick <laughs> throttling cock cock. He's back. Oh, God, now. that's worse. That's worse. No, because a cock would be a cockerel, and this was a hen. Okay. Well. Yeah. So, so no, no, no playing with cocks then. No. No. Oh. Choking the chicken, I think, is a euphemism as well, isn't it? Is that an it American is. one? Yeah, it's, oh my god, it's going down the wrong rabbit hole, isn't it? Um, yeah, if and we're clicking that button, well, we've got to get our money's worth. Right? My if nan that... would skin rabbits and gut rabbits and stuff. That wasn't uncommon for a, you know a farm girl, and yeah. No, so. no, no. If you if you live on a farm, it's fair enough. If you're killing animals and you don't, then you're probably likely to grow up into some sort of serial killer, aren't you? I Jeffrey Dahmer type it. character, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's all they all <laughs> start. Do, do they all share that? They all share that that trait, don't they? They were like setting, putting spiders on fire with magnifying glasses and something. Although I think we all did. We all do that. Oh, no. here we go. Here we go. Yeah. No. I did it once. Weirdo. The boys, right? At this time of year, when you used to like go back to school, there was like um, the, one side of the, the school was like kind of the, the wall was warm when we were outside in the playground. And all the crane flies, they're called like daddy long legs, they all used to like sit on this wall. And oh my God, the boys used to go up to them, grab them, and then like they used to like push Take them their legs in the off. face and pull the legs off. Oh God, it was just horrendous. Horrible. Uh, just, didn't, did, <laughs> Dom, didn't you and I have a discussion late night about people pulling legs off and then putting them in certain places? Uh-huh. I'm sure. Yeah, uh, uh, it was. A, I thought it was a sexual fetish thing. That right. if you did, if you did that to a like, oh, it was a, a fly or something like that. You basically took the legs off and you put it on the, the top of your old your old man. Um, <laughs> little like, Charlie. Yeah. So like it, but like it, like I didn't do it, but I heard that some people did it. What? I'm not what sure it's true. Hell? It's like you put the buzzing, from? you put the thing in, and it buzzes away because it can't do anything because it's got uh, no legs. But you put it on the top of your your John Thomas. Well, if it didn't have any legs, it make, doesn't mean it can't fly because it's still got the wings. That's no, the buzzing. No, I think there was it's just I can't remember what no, it was. Talking about Daddy Long Legs, which is a spider. This is the most horrible conversation yeah. we've had on the oh my pod god ever. That's horrendous. So yeah, well, that's a sexual. Some people got a buzz out of it. I think you're making that up, though. It's not true. I will put it in the WhatsApp chat after this. No. It's, a, it's a 70s thing, yeah. Oh, no. Well, no. all right, okay. Was it... No, was it... It wasn't a wasp. It can't have been a wasp. Oh, my no God. No way you would have done that. 
Anyway, I'll find it out. Chapsy. I'll tell you in 20 minutes when Chapsy. we finish this. That's the medical term, isn't it? Chapsy. Right, come on. So I think, <laughs> should, we, should, we, should we bring this? Should we bring this baby home? Um, the So the countryside scenes unfold. Eventually, he eavesdrops on what they really think of him, Uncle Monty, and departs for London. And Paul McGann's character gets a telegram through the post that he's got an acting opportunity. Um, and but he's got the part. He's got the part, got the, the main role, part, rather yeah. than the part he went for. And, and Richard E. Grant, through gritted teeth, congratulates him, despite <laughs> clearly being devastated by this uh, news. Um, they drive home, and there's the hilarious drunk driving scene where they get pulled over and he tries to uh, fob them off with the uh, Heath Robinson style improvised <laughs> device that the drug dealer sold him full of child's piss um, and they celebrate I have only had a few ales that's the line isn't it in the uh, when he's when he's rested um, and they have the legendary Camberwell carrot the joint that requires 12 residents oh god um, yeah that's yeah. massive yeah but you know and obviously not that I ever got involved in but I did hear at university that that sort of thing got recreated off the back of this film and uh yeah. yeah it was a sight to behold did you guys have cheech and chong over there Ooh. yeah yeah cheech yeah. and chong i mean they used to make joints like that they used to do movies and and record albums and they used to talk about getting high there and like some mexican guys they were pretty funny but that's what it reminded me of that joint it was pretty damn big the closest we had to that was Derek and clive so peter cook and dudley moore Derek and Clive come again. Um, uh, is, and they would get high or they would get drunk? They would get horribly drunk. Like, oh, okay. like they'd be on drunk, which for Peter Cook was probably, you know, an afternoon. Um, but they, and then they'd hit, then they'd hit the recording and they would have pre-prepared stuff that they would have. But it's funny because it, it, it it's, it's just a mess, but it's so, so good to listen to. And Peter Rose, Peter, um, uh, Peter Cook's use of the C word is just amazing. But you've never lived until you've heard Dudley Moore, who you think was, oh, he was in that nice Santa Claus film, and oh, he was in Arthur. Oh, that lovable old rogue. Nope, he swears like a navvy. He's, uh, oh, he's brilliant. I will, I'll put you a link to that, Joe. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you'd like that. But anyway. I, I, I thought the end of the film, as we, as we bring it home then, what is... So they go their separate ways, don't they? So the film's about, I suppose, if it's about anything, it's about the end of a friendship as well, isn't it? All the, the changes that, that come. So Paul McGann's on the cusp of getting his shit together. He's got he's had a haircut, a shave, um, off to Manchester for his new leading man role, declines the final drink with with Nail. Um, so he embarks on that journey sober, and you leave with Nail sort of shouting into the void, really, I suppose, the outside the Wolf Sanctuary in London. Rain lashing down on him, quoting the um, Hamlet speech, um, and I thought it's sad because uh, I think the, yeah. in, in the book uh, it says at the end of the novel, with Nell dies by suicide by pouring a bottle of wine into the barrel of Monty's shotgun and then pulling the trigger as he drank from it. But the director changed the endings; he believed it was too dark. But I still think the, end, the ending strongly implies that he's on a downward spiral, so he's lost yeah. his one bit of stability. Um, Hmm. And I don't know that you're left to your imagination, but I imagine a life of kind of vagrancy and. No, I think Danny moved in destitution. You do, yeah. Well, they, yeah, they yeah. didn't. They didn't sign on, did they? So they wouldn't have got the next week's. Yeah, because they were all away. Employment so they could... benefit, yeah, so yeah. he would have been without that money for the next week. So yeah, it would have but been hard. The guy, the guy that it was based on, Vivian McCarroll, he he was dead at fifty-one. Um, and yeah, I guess that's the trajectory that with nails on at the end of this film. So, so you know, for a comedy, for a black, admittedly black comedy, I thought it ended on a slightly somber, somber note. Yeah, it was sad. Yeah, it was sad. Yeah, it was. Um, I just got a bit of trivia before we give our scores and then uh, announce the the next film um, that we'll be doing. Um, the first screening, uh, uh, the director was there with the film company, and nobody laughed uh, at all during the whole film. And at the end of it, they realised that it was because it was filmed full of German tourists who didn't speak <laughs> English. So they didn't obviously didn't understand it. I mean, no, even if they probably did audience. know a little bit. Yeah. Exactly. Um, the tea room where Richard E. Grant is, uh, I'm going to buy this place and install a fucking jukebox. Um, <laughs> he's laughing throughout that. But the reason he's laughing is because the women behind him had snorting dogs 
which he thought was hilarious. So he could hear it, but nobody else could. So that's why he's laughing. And that's so many takes they had. And in the end, they just said, fuck it, just leave it in. And so that's why that's left in. He's laughing at the dogs behind him. Um, he didn't know, Richard E. Grant didn't know the film was popular until he went to France and somebody wound the window down and shouted, Scrubbers! at him and he and Paul McGann was in Canada and somebody walked up to him and went have you gone on holiday by mistake which I think's brilliant love it oh, but yeah there we go so yeah so it's time for the time for the schools then should we go in the order that, that we so I'm, I'm going last of I so I think we start with with Joe so Joe um thank you for bearing with us on this eccentric tour around late 60s England um what's your what's your verdict yeah like I said it, it was fun just listening to you guys talk about the movie and it, it may have increased my score so not Ooh. that it's it's oh, very like high that. but I, I I would give it a probably seven out of ten mm -hmm. if I watch it a second time I might go higher a third time well fantastic Joe glad glad, glad you enjoyed it and uh, yeah a bit of a gamble but that's that's brilliant and Amanda, what about yourself? Yeah, uh, so if I'd have watched it, having never watched it before, I probably wouldn't be giving it the score that I am. But because I I enjoy it and I actually get it, um, I'm giving it a nine. Mm. Excellent, excellent, brilliant. Some good scores there. And, and Charlie, what, what about I'm, yourself? I'm going to go along with a nine as well. I just think it's, there are little minor annoyances and i can't give it a 10 um in, in the same way but uh, the one thing is i was out with some friends yesterday and they said oh what's the next podcast what are you doing i said oh we're recording it tomorrow we're recording with Dale and i and all six of them had no idea what i was talking about and you know they're all roughly the same roughly at the same sort of age and i was just like so some people just genuinely must have missed it yeah and and i've missed this you know the the classic if this was on in a cinema I would I would go to the cinema to see this. I would go and see this with people around me. Uh, I'm sure there would be a sign at the front going, "Stop! Don't quote the whole film," you know. But there's certain and, and like points where you could shout out. Um, and I don't know if that happens because it'd be like Rocky Horror where they'd be shouting out everything and you know doing certain things at certain times. Um, I can't wait until this like so the the electric or somewhere like that. Um, they might yeah. not let you win if they know who you are. They'll be asking a, a you little Charlie if you got a, a pot of <laughs> legless flies. <laughs> I'm gonna show it to you. you you're you're all gonna rue the day, as they say. As they say. Oh a fucker God. will rue the day. <laughs> so um so just so for me then, I I, I so do think this is probably if I think what's my favourite British film of all time, it's 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 hard. There are some good contenders there. Um Wicker Man. American Werewolf in London, I guess that's Anglo-American production, isn't it? But this this is right up there, possibly is my favourite British film of all time. I think it's brilliantly acted. I think it's a, um, really evocative of the time that it's set. I think it's a, mo a modern classic, really, for me. And so I don't overuse this card, but I'm going to score it a 10 out of 10. It's one of my personal favourite oh, films. Nice. Mm. I, could, I could watch it again um, tonight, tomorrow, next week. Uh, yeah, very, very enjoyable, very quotable, and uh, has formed a... Yeah, a bit of a line through my life uh, in various parts over the years. So, yeah, happy trip yeah. down memory lane watching something like this for me. So we did 10 last week for Dirty Dancing from you, man. Uh, mm. 10 now. Right, well, I was about to say there's only one more film to go. There is one more film to go in The Lucky Dip. But we do have Halloween to, to do as well. So what, what do you think we should do? The last film, but then we're going to be recording it like first week of November, which is isn't really Halloweenish. So should we do the Halloween film and then finish? Well let's not let's not get the admin out for the uh for the audience, say eh? um right, okay. well, but... it, it'll either be next one, it'll either be Lucky Dip or it'll be a horror film, but it most out most likely be a horror film. So yeah, right. Well, count oh, me out oh. then, because I won't be in on that one. Oh. I'm the scaredy cat, yeah. So you can't tell us what the lucky dip is? Uh I might should I? Do you want to tell, tell you what my final film is? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, as the intro suggests, do you like uh, wearing a corked hat and fighting crocodiles? We're going to go where? Uh, we're going to go to Crocodile Dundee. 
Which one? The first one? Oh, the first one. Well, oh. I, I, I said that with contempt. I actually enjoyed the second one. Uh, and I do, and we will discuss, and please do some homework if you can, the very excellent Mr. Dundee. If you can manage to watch that uh, between now and it might be possibly four weeks, it might be two weeks, it might be four weeks. Um, that is such a bizarre film where they, Netflix want to remake Cro Crocodile Dundee 2. Oh, sorry, Crocodile Dundee 3. That's what we want to do, but it's already been made. Has it? Anyway, yes. it's a good film. It's yeah, in so Los Angeles, right? No, so Crocodile Dundee 3 is in Los Angeles because of the Netflix people only know that first two were made. They haven't bothered to do any research to see. And they want to make number three. He's going, oh, well, okay. I've already made it, mate. Um, anyway, cool. So let's do the admin then. So let's uh, get say goodbye and then let's do this. So I'm going to say uh, cheerio, everyone. See you next time. Chin chin. Bye bye. Up your bum. <laughs> Doodle pip. <laughs> bye. <Up> you. <laughs> <laughs>